It's great to have you. I know it's the Sunday that a lot of people are visiting, going around, going to different places, delivering presents, or you might be thinking about your next journey to have. But it's great to have you here at St. John's uh, Church Crawley. I'm Steve. I'm the vicar. I lead this church with my wonderful wife, like life, wife, uh, wife, Liz. Um, and so it's great, great to be here. We had a great day yesterday. We had the traditional carol service. We had no hair lit, which is always good with the candles. It's always great when no one's hair goes up in flames. And uh, then we went off to St. Peter's, uh, I nearly said Brighton, but St. Peter's in West Green, where we had pulled pork, not a hog roast. I kept on advertising as a hog roast, but it was pulled pork. And we had 140 people gather. And I'd say, well, I'd say about 80 of those I didn't know at all. So that was a great witness and great uh, team that did that throughout the two services. But here we gather today on Sunday. I'm just going to put the scripture reading up straight away. It's in the NIV version. It is from 1 John uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. James, if I could ask you to keep it up throughout the service, that would be great. Let's read God's word to, before we start anything at all. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also have the fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with the, his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. There we go. Uh, to get it, it wasn't quite complete on one page. But uh, we to, that's ironic. But nevertheless, the word of God carries on. I can, you can put, just remember complete at the end and that would be great. Powerful words. Um, we're in this season that we're calling a season we're exploring joy. We're saying it's not the most obvious or the easiest choice to make but it's a choice that we nonetheless make. It's an invitation that Jesus gives all of us, is to choose joy. And I was just, you know, been contemplating the last few weeks, you know, as you know, we've been just dealing with Lizzie's mum's death and going through the funeral. It's like, okay, so this is an invitation. That still needs me to pick up the invitation. I'm like, oh, have I got the energy to pick up that invitation in different places? So what does that actually mean? But what I think it means is we just open ourselves up to his joy and it is complete in us and I'll come to that in a moment but I think in this time as we go into Advent we're in the third Advent Tom Wright would say to us the first Advent was the Jewish people waiting for the Messiah to come so Simeon you know the story of Simeon at the temple his eyes have been enlightened the Nunctus he sees Jesus as he's presented that's the first coming that's what most of the Pharisees and the most of the people of Israel failed to miss was that first coming of Jesus and now we're in kind of a second advent where every year we celebrate the, uh, uh, the birth of Jesus. So we have advent candles, advent calendars, and we sit and prepare ourselves each year for the year ahead. But actually, we're in this other stage that we are awaiting and watching for the second coming. But do we live our lives like that? Do we live our lives awaiting and expecting and praying in that third advent? Or do we want to leave things as they are and the third advent can come when we've gone to glory and it'll come a different time? But do we want to see Jesus come again? Just a question as we contemplate and we break open God's word this morning. But as we come into Advent, we've got to remember, as um, Charlotte so brilliantly preached to us, uh, it's a well-worn story, a comforting, a familiar uh, story of the Christmas story. But Advent is about all about Jesus. It's not just comfortable words. It should be shocking, the gospel, in our time and place. Rowan Williams described the gospel once as like a hand grenade being thrown into a room and turning everything upside down. 
We've lost the power sometimes in the power of the story. And so our passage this morning isn't about a series of events. We read that in the Gospels and in the traditional carols. We'll see all the storylines. This is what it meant. This is what the incarnation, Jesus becoming flesh, meant. These are the words that we'll come to in a moment, written by the Apostle John. But maybe we need to recenter ourselves and press into the story about the power, the upside down kingdom, the love and the faith that is Jesus. Joy, I know it's a spur can be used to say, Jesus, only you. Jesus, only you. Whatever circumstances you face this week or in the last year, it's Jesus, only you. He is the only answer to all the problems that we have. He's the only person that can change our lives. Nothing else. We will look for it in all different ways, but we need to continue to gather as church in this country and this world and say always, Jesus, only you. Jesus, only you. Whatever emotions you've got this morning, wherever you feel tired, down, distracted, angry, fearful, worried about your list that you haven't got to the bottom of. I don't have a list, so I'm never bothered about getting to the bottom of it. But then I have a panic about Christmas Eve when I go, oh my word, I need to raise my game. But whatever emotion we've got, it's just Jesus, only you. Everything I faced in life, through the 52 and soon to be 53, with my birthday on Christmas Day, years of life, it's when I look back, even before I knew Christ, it was Jesus, only you. He is the only solution. Through my three girls are sitting there in the second row, the whole life I will say to them, the only solution in life will be Jesus, only you. And so that's for each one of us this morning, whatever you carry, however lonely you are, however difficult it might seem, however fraught or however joyful and celebratory and wonderful things are right now it's always Jesus under you whatever circumstances and so let's press into that today let's press into Jesus only you let's not make it about stuff that it's not there's more joy in advertising this Christmas than I've ever seen maybe because we've decided to do joy but everywhere I go boots have nicked it I'm going to speak to Peter Markey he's head of marketing for boots they've nicked it it's the season of joy hold on that's us I go into Asda and they've got a set of bottles now of wine that say joy. I was like, great, don't have the red, it's awful. Liz thought it was a great idea when she brought it back. When we tasted it, it was like, hmm, that doesn't bring joy. White's not so bad. There's cushions, there's jumpers. Everything in this world is crying out for joy but doesn't know which way to turn it. So let's put it on the wall and pretend that that will bring us joy. No, it's Jesus, only him or you. So let's get back to that message again and again, every day, every hour, that is the solution. In 1738, there was a group of Anglicans gathering in London that were really dissatisfied with the church and with religion. They gathered and they couldn't understand why actually there wasn't a burning passion and that they hadn't got a life faith. But they they knew that something was wrong and they started gathering as Anglicans and they started to gather in churches going, this cannot be it. This cannot be the one thing that we've given our lives to. One of those were two brothers, John and Charles Wesley. And they were saying, this cannot be it. One one of his diaries, Charles Wesley wrote, he's a famous hymn writer if you don't know, right in May 1738, I've just taken the Eucharist but I didn't take Christ. I've just taken the body and blood of Jesus but I don't know Jesus in it. And so that was like dead religion. Not that the Eucharist is dead religion but his heart wasn't all in. Suddenly a few days later one of his best friends was reading, got him, got Charles Wesley to read out the, uh, pre, uh, the prologue to Martin Luther uh, uh, commentary on the book of Galatians. As he read it out, his friend came to faith and met Jesus in the room and they all saw him changed. Charles Wesley, who was reading it, was going, oh my goodness, nothing happened for me. 
But that always gives us hope, doesn't it, in meetings when things happen for other people and we sit there and go, oh my goodness, they seem to be meeting God, but I'm not. That happens in all circumstances. That's, I can't work that out. It's above my pay grade. But what it does mean is that we come back to Jesus, only you, again and again and again. And so Charles Wellesley did, and a few days later, and, uh, and through that faith, his faith came alive. Because he kept on saying to himself, Jesus, only you. I want the joy of Christ. Jesus, only you. So maybe today you go back and as we examine this scripture, which is where joy will be found. As I said numerous times, if you want a word from God, get in the word of God. If you want to have an affirmation for God, get in a conversation with God in prayer. And so maybe it's a time to say again and again as a family, maybe you gather and you put, even if you've got a young family, write joy on paper cards and you stick them on your tree. Because actually what the joy stuff, even when we pass boots and as the red wine, forgive me, Lord. Even when we look at that, let it say Jesus only you because it takes us back again and again to the story we were in. So Jesus only you. Christmas is about the incarnation of God in the form of Jesus Christ. I've, this is an old one, I say it every year, but if you take Christ out of Christmas, all you get is m &S. But it's, it's at the end. We forget it, don't we? We get so caught up in the Christmas. We need to come back to Christ. And it isn't like, it's even one of the worship uh, songs this morning was telling us about how we were turning to Christ. That's true to an extent, but the incarnation is about how Christ came to us. Isn't something we explain or examine? The incarnation is just the experience of Christ coming to us, the joy of Christ coming to us, dwelling in flesh. So if the nativity stories is about what happened, these words from 1 John is about what it means for each one of us. John wrote three letters. He wrote the Gospel of John. He wrote Revelations. He was one of the apostles. He was the elder. Uh, he had an elder brother, James. He was sons of Zebedee or the sons of thunder. Peter, James and John were the intimate friends of Jesus. And his words are ones centred on love. If you read the Gospel of John, it will be structured uh, I, d I know this because I did this at Theological College, structured as a trial. If you look at it, the Gospel of John is about weighing up the evidence and the truth. And actually, it talks a lot about eyewitness events. And actually, what John is saying is, these really tangibly happened. If you look at even in our reading at one, that there's words in there from that which from the beginning, you know, when we think of John's gospel, that takes us straight back to John's gospel, doesn't it? It takes us, in the, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And it takes us right back to the story of Genesis in the beginning. He's telling us that this is the eternal story that we all find ourselves in. None of you are outside the story of God. He has a plan for each one of you. He knows you intimately and the joy of Jesus, Jesus only you, is available for you and me if we turn and open our hearts and allow him to come to us. We push him away and turn our backs on him numerous times. And then he says, doesn't he, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. Anyone reading this in the ancient world would have known this is the statements of witness statements of court of law, saying this is tangibly true. We have seen, heard and touched it. He could have said, I tasted it, when he talks about the body and blood of Christ. This is someone that has been resting his shoulder on Jesus. And he wants people to know that is where the joy is from. Let us this morning taste, hear, touch, feel Jesus. Be that in an encouraging word from a friend. Be that in the worship. Be that in prayer ministry. Be that in his word. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The word of life is Jesus. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Jesus has always existed. And so what this tells us, this reading, is the incarnation is that Jesus 
is our grace. We are saved by grace alone, nothing else. So the joy of Jesus doesn't come because you've done anything good or you deserve it, because none of us do. Our readings at the nine o'clock were about John the Baptist being unworthy to untie the thongs of the sandal of Jesus, basically saying that a slave would take the sandals off. And John the Baptist didn't even in Jesus' presence feel worthy enough to do that. Salvation by grace is no one's worthy to do that, but Jesus by his death and resurrection and his love for you and me means that we're all worthy. We're all worthy. We are saved by grace. This isn't some fable or story. This is the truth that Jesus came, Jesus lived, Jesus died and rose again for you and me. Because John says he heard it, he saw it, and he touched it. This grace is about God penetrating the womb of a single Jewish girl and then stepping into the world in flesh, into vulnerability, into our story, into reality with a unique claim, the claim that changes everything. It's not a claim that Judaism or Islam would accept because they'd say it was impossible. Or they would say that Buddhism or uh, Hinduism would say it was unnecessary. But we know that it's the only way that chasm that Pete and Emily sung about as between us is filled. It's because he became flesh so that we could experience the salvation and his grace. It's where the dimness becomes bright, the brokenness becomes whole, the weaker becomes strong. It's where in my anxiety and my fear I can get out of bed in the morning and do life. It's where in my celebrations with family I can give the joy to Jesus because in the dark times he's been with me. Jesus only you, the joy, grace filled, deep well of grace. Tim Keller put it like this when I was preparing this week. He said, pretend they're football teams as opposed to American football teams. But he said, there's like two teams going to the Super Bowl, the like World Cup. And he said, one team is the best team in the world. Maybe, I won't say a team because I'll upset everyone. Um, but it's the best team in the world. It's got the best players and they should be in the final. And then there's a team that should never have been in the final. They've just played good team. They've got a bit lucky on the way. They don't feel they deserve to be there. And he said, how imagine those two teams will face going into the final. One team will be just joyful to be there. One team will be so anxious and fearful, they probably won't play their best. They might still win, but there won't be any joy in it. Maybe that's the gospel for us sometimes today is that we're probably on a team that don't deserve to be there, but because of Jesus Christ, we are. And boy, we're going to have fun when we play it. Let's do life like that. The joy of Christ. Jesus, only you. And so if this message from John sent to us about Jesus is about the salvation of Christ, it's also about the fellowship with God. It's about fellowship with God. This reminds us in these verses that the God, what God has done is infinitely immeasurable to what we can imagine. We cannot get our heads around what he's done in this moment. We can grasp parts of it and that brings us joy. But this is outstandingly good news for all of us. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify and we proclaim to you the eternal life with which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We live in a world that is lonely, that is isolated, and is the plague of our age alongside anxiety. Everything in our being puts barriers between friendships and fellowship. We can do it ourselves. We can be angry and annoyed. We can feel lonely and think people don't understand us. I know that in grief you can do that. You can push people away. When people are in loss, 
you know, be it through a diagnosis or where you, know, you don't want people to be around. That's exactly what the Bible tells us is we need to be in community together in those moments. Everything in our being as human beings do not want to do it because we, we, we hang out in the pain. We don't want to bring anyone down. But the Jesus only you means they're the moments that you get together and you feel the love of God and you can laugh because you've got each other. That's an incredible thing. And you think God did so much that he wanted to get to know us. He wanted to fill that gap that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be with us. You see, we read again and again in the Old Testament that we can't be in the presence of God. Moses, you know, he's, he was changed, but there was a veil. There was, there was Isaiah in the presence of God was ruined. But with Jesus, we can. One commentator said it was like looking at the sun, not the sun, the sun, but the sun in the sky, which is a distant memory right now. But there is a thing up in the sky that keeps us warm in the, in the summer called the sun. And if we try to look at it directly, we burn our eyes, don't we? Our retinas can be burned and it hurts. But in some way, we need to use a filter to look at the sun. And for us, the filter to look at God and be intimate, close to God is his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, only you. So we encounter Jesus. We encounter through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's come to be our advocate, our helper, to experience Jesus that lives in me and you so that we might be in commune with the Father. And so Advent is a time to think about why did Jesus come to save us through grace, to give us fellowship with the Father, And to say that love matters. Jesus came to show that God so loved the world. That love triumphs over all things. That love is both grace and truth. I'm not just saying it. Just, but the love of Jesus changes lives. We know through the life of Jesus that we read in scripture the life of Jesus we experience through the power of the Holy Spirit, the life of Jesus that we experience in this thing called church. We know that what God is, his love, his compassion, his anger, his patience, his kindness, his joy, it tells us that we are connected to Jesus. Jesus, only you. We can intellectually grasp Jesus we can explain it and unpack it, deconstruct it. But the incarnation is about a relationship. It's about a love that is poured out from the cross into our lives. God so loved the world that he gave his only son as a baby, as a refugee, into a broken place. I saw a picture uh, from social media, possibly, at some stage, about what the, today's manger would look like. It was a pile of rubber, ru rubble in Gaza. Is where would Jesus be born into right now? Couldn't be more vulnerable if you tried. And the God that's all-powerful, that can move mountains chose to meet us in our weakness so we might know him. Jesus, only you. And so when I look at the news and look at all the things that are happening, I remember that God has a redeeming love. That whatever situation and relationship, whatever things that we're going through, Liz has gone off to the hospital now because we think possibly her dad's had a stroke and so it's on top of what she's doing. But there's redeeming love. The redeeming love of Christ is in that room. And that is the joy that we have. Jesus, only you. Redeeming love. And so, Alfred Hitchcock films, some of you will not know, but I do, black and white. What did Alfred Hitchcock do in his movies? Anyone know? I've changed straight to the killing. That wasn't quite so. That's good. He always appears in his movies. 
He does. He always appears. Well done, Eddie. So he always appears in his movies. And actually what the incarnation means is God so loved the world that he's written himself into the story. He's written himself into the story so that we might have joy. That's what he's done it for. It's so that he's written in, he's in every hospital room. He's in every marriage counselling. He's in every church service. He's in every bedroom as you pray with your kids. He's alongside us in every part of our lives. He might be on a boat that you had to escape from uh, Iran from. Jesus is always there. The joy, Jesus, only you. And so, finally, Jesus, only you, the incarnation means that each one of us has a deep river of joy underneath of us. We choose to either fill it up with Jesus or fill it up with the world and dam off our rivers of joy through our insecurities and our fears. We can dam up that river, but the river is there. When we're looking at St. John's house and we're still looking at it, if you go down into the basement, it's damp and it's wet because underneath Crawley is a marsh, apparently. I'd like to think of it more like a living waters of Jesus Christ. But it's always damp and there's water. For us, we have living rivers of Jesus open to us. And so when things hit us, when things knock us sideways, I know it's Jesus, only you. And that's what bubbles to the surface. Because the world's going to be distracting to us all the time. Bubbling up underneath us, Jesus, only you. So we're going to pray for each other in a moment. But just know that he came to save you by grace. Nothing you earn or deserve. If that was the case, I wouldn't be leading your church. Because I need the grace of Jesus. Secondly, he's done it so you might have fellowship. Me and you with each other as Christians. But with God himself. Thirdly, he's done it. Quickly look back. (laughs) It's because love matters. His redeeming love is always coming. And fourthly, he's done it so you have rivers of living water pouring through your lives. Jesus, only you. Amen.